Okay, we all can start. Uh, I was just asked to speak up, so nothing particularly dramatic is happening. I'm just trying to reach all parts of the room because we are we are wide. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to invite all of you to the talk that we are going to have now. Uh, John Shatechka is our today's speaker. John is one of two inaugural Mihaichu postdoctoral fellows here at the Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. He is a historian of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union with a particular interest in the 20th century Ukrainian history. In June 2023, June defended his doctoral dissertation at Michigan State University. While there, he also earned a graduate certificate in digital humanities for his work on numerous projects related to his research. John is the founder and current co-editor of H Ukraine, and probably most of you know this resource, which really, in, in my opinion, revolutionized the field. Uh, it is part of the larger HNET platform. It promotes and shares academic and scholarly content related to the study of Ukraine. During the 2021-2022 academic year, John was on a Fulbright grant in Kiev before, before having to leave due to Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Following the invasion, John spent time in Poland doing humanitarian work and assisting Ukrainian refugees as part of the humanitarian group for peace. Additionally, John serves as a host of the New Books Network podcast in Ukrainian studies. You can find his scholarship and public facing writing in numerous journals, books, and online media platforms. So it is a great pleasure to have John speaking today. As all of you know, the topic of the discussion is presentation and then Q&A discussion is in the wake of hunger, confronting the legacies of the 1932-1933 famine, Holodomor in Ukraine during the 1930s. So John, welcome and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to, you know, Megan for setting this up and to the Institute for inviting me to speak today. It's a real pleasure to be on the other side of these tables um, and give a talk. I've attended many here and online in the past, and so it's, it's great to be here. I, I'm going to apologize in advance because I just realized that it's Valentine's Day and um, delivering a lecture on famine is perhaps not the most romantic topic for February 14th. But nonetheless, I think it's an important one, particularly this month, as we are set to, to mark two years of the full-scale invasion coming up. Um, and I think it's important that we talk about Ukraine and its history, and particularly the whole of the more. So what I want to do is take the next, we'll say, 40, 45 minutes or so. I will try and keep it to that. Um, so there's plenty of time for conversation and dialogue and questions. Uh, and I want to offer some insights about why I think the study of the aftermath of the famine is critical to the historiography, not just of the whole of the war, but of Ukrainian history in general. And I want to make some connections to, to the current events, to the war now, um, that I think are worth discussing. But before I get to this, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how I came to this topic, because I, I find it really interesting when scholars and historians sort of reveal how they came to study certain events. Um, and this project is both personal for me and professional. So um, I want to talk just briefly about sort of a confluence of three events that brought me to study um, the aftermath of the whole of the war. One was um, the death of my stepmother in 2019 unexpectedly at the young age of 48. Um, she left behind, um, you know, a husband, kids, family, everything like this. And it became clear in the months and years sort of after she passed away that although she had died and lived a life and we sort of, you know, bracket people's lives by birth dates and death dates, um, the reverberations of her death continued to be important and continue to affect us. Um, now, at the same time, I was in my last semester of coursework for my doctoral studies, and I was taking a class on historic uh, trauma, historical trauma and justice with the scholar Ronan Steinberg, who's a historian of the French Revolution and the terror. 
And um, I started to read widely about uh, different genocides and episodes of mass violence and how people work to come to terms with what they lived through afterwards. And it was in the same semester that my advisor, Matt Pauley, um, sort of encouraged me to look to the period after the famine and start thinking in that direction about how did people make sense of the famine and work to deal with its legacies. So th these sort of uh, three events connected me and got me thinking on the track of um, I was dealing with something in my own life that was a tragedy, and I'm studying the whole of the more, and I wanted to sort of use that as a start-off point to think about how Ukrainians would have started to come to terms um, with the famine that they lived through in the 1930s. So as we shift to the aftermath, um, I, I want us to think back about how we've gotten to, to this sort of segment of whole of the more studies um, in the current moment. So it's become its own field of studies that really emerged in the 1980s um, in, in real vigor in the academic setting. Um, I would say that it was, you know, Robert Conquest's book in 1986 that sort of set a precedent for this, um, of which Hurry and Harvard had played a role in promoting. Um, and it became a recognized field of study. And since then, we've learned quite a bit about um, the events leading up to the famine, industrialization, Soviet agricultural policies, collectivization, and other events that sort of came before. However, we still know considerably less about the short-term and long-term effects of the famine. Now, this is not to say that those gestures toward looking past the end date of the famine and understanding these effects haven't been there since the beginning. They have. If you go to the last chapter in Conquest's book in 1986, he writes a small chapter on the aftermath. Um, some of you are probably familiar with Anne Applebaum's book, uh, where she also has a chapter on the aftermath. And others in, in various um, edited volumes, people like Olya Andreevsky, Andrea Graziosi, Stanislav Kolchitsky, and others have also been gesturing towards this, although they've been sort of limited in the sort of scope of what the aftermath can be. Now, there was a book published actually by the Institute here in 2013 called After the Whole of the Moor, of which several members of this institute were involved in publishing. And it resulted from a conference that had taken place in 2008 of the same title. And this really brought together um, several renowned scholars to start thinking and talking about what the implications of the famine were in the years that followed. And in my opinion, this book is still one of the best on the topic and really one of the only ones that exists to this day. Um, so what this means is that there's quite a bit to still learn about the aftermath uh, of the famine. And I think that my work here, which I'm talking about is my book manuscript that's in progress right now, um, will contribute sort of a new understanding of the personal, social, and cultural implications of the famine in Ukraine in the period immediately following the famine in the resulting 1930s. And I'll talk more about why I sort of end in the 1930s. Um, in addition to scholarship on Ukraine, I also, you know, have been heavily influenced by a wider historiography on what is called the aftermath. Um, I started to read books like Toby Meyer Fong's What Remains about the aftermath of civil war in 19th century China. Um, another Harvard connection, Drew Faust, her book, This Republic of Suffering, which is about the way that death during the American Civil War transformed America. And also from uh, a committee member of mine, Ronan Steinberg, his book, The Afterlives of the Terror, which is about coming to terms with the violence of the terror and issues of transitional justice after the French Revolution. So I sort of looked to these texts to inspire me um, to start thinking about the sort of topics that I wanted to talk about and write about that hadn't been written about in some of the wider historiography on the whole of the more. So, some main points I want us to consider as I talk about what's in my book manuscript. Um, it starts with that despite mass starvation largely coming to an end by the summer of 1933, we usually bracket the famine between 1932 and 1933, um, the effects of the famine, famine continued to remain of central preoccupation for years to come. Uh, the remaining years of the 1930s, I think, were a critical time when survivors first started to comprehend and attempt to work through the horrors through which they lived. Um, and, and so most texts sort of end in 1933 or around 1933 when writing about the famine. Um, mine starts in 1933 in the height of the famine in the spring and moves forward. 
Uh, and I do this because I think that it, it captures the transition from the height of the famine when some almost 30,000 people are dying a day at its height um, to the end by roughly July, although it's a slow conclusion um, and the repercussions last for quite some time. Now, there are a number of legacies that the famine leads, leaves behind, and I, I can't write about them all, um, but the ones that I, I do sort of confront in my own work um, has to do with math, mass death across Ukraine, what it means to, to you know, confront um, millions of dead bodies and what's done with them, um, how people work through trauma and grief, dealing with the fears of future famine that exist after the precedent of the whole of the war, um, and addressing the, the social and cult, uh, cultural ruptures caused by the man-made famine. Um, and I examine these effects on different levels to sort of get a, you know, a sense of the way that these were happening on the social, the personal, the familial, the international and cultural levels. Now, I also think that the famine, you know, sort of leaves behind what I would call ghosts. And there's a whole literature on ghosts and haunting. Um, and the way that I see it is that these ghosts, I think we can think of them as unresolved issues of the past, making themselves present in the present. Um, and the Holodomor produced several ghosts that haunted Ukraine. And I'll talk more about this as, as we move forward in the talk. Um, and what you probably know, too, is that this, the famine was covered up in silence deliberately. But despite the silencing, um, Ukrainians still found unique ways to make sense of the famine and to come to terms with it, although this wasn't always successful. So, you know, while I don't debate the notion that it was silenced, of course it was, um, I still think that we have to make room in order to see the way that Ukrainians did respond um, despite the silencing, you know, despite the, um, the, the, the covering up. And so this is what my work attempts to do. Uh, and then I think finally, the book contributes to sort of a social history of the famine's aftermath and centers the experience of everyday Ukrainians. Um, which we still need more texts on. Um, we need to do more to center the experiences of individuals. Um, so that is what I do. I just want to say that if you think through um, the aftermath as, I, it, it helps me sort of think through this as a boat passing through water. Um, you can think of that boat as the boat as the you know famine that goes through and it leaves behind ripple effects. And it's those ripple effects behind the boat that I'm interested in studying, how they continue to influence and impact society. So I think to fully understand um, any genocide, event of mass violence, you have to start with bodies. And what I mean by that are corpses, dead bodies. Um, you have to look to the dead. Now, there is a robust literature that advocate for the dead to be sort of observed and seen and incorporated in studies of aftermaths. Um, and that's because they're immediate physical markers of the damage that's been inflicted. Now, there were millions of bodies uh, scattered across Ukraine. They couldn't be buried fast enough. People were dying at such an increased rate that people were you know, dying on the sides of roads, in markets, on streets, et cetera. And people had to confront these. They would literally step over bodies on the way to work. Um, crews, the sort of brigades would have to pick them up, put them on carts and take them to mass graves and dump them. Um, the geography of the way that they disposed of bodies differed across Ukraine. So in Southern and Eastern Ukraine, uh, they would put them in sort of goalies. A lot of times they used abandoned mine shafts where they would you know, dispose of bodies there. But there was a number of ways of confronting these that I think are worth exploring. Um, and I, I argue that confronting and interacting with these corpses was a key moment in which, you know, the toll of the famine is originally communicated to the living. The bodies help those survivors feel the toll of what they've lived through because they're seeing it every day of their life. Now, I borrow this term corporal confrontations from the work of Christopher Moriello, who is a historian who wrote a book called Force Confrontations, and it's about the way that people sort of encounter bodies after World War II in Germany. And he talks about what this does for society. And so I, I use this sort of framework to look at the whole of the more as well. Now, in the, in the book, I actually write um, about the sensory experiences of encountering these bodies. So what I mean by that is the way that people were seeing them, touching them, um, you know, even the sounds that accompanied death uh, the smells that they had, 
and the way that in some cases were even consumed issues of cannibalism. And I think that paying attention to the sensory experience, which I, I borrow heavily from those historians who work on sensory history, is that it gets us as close to that moment as we possibly can to understand the overwhelming toll of what it was like to be surrounded by the dead. And it's really hard for us to imagine in this sort of current moment. Um, but at the time, you know, it, it was a common experience. Now, um, I think, too, that we have to think here about the idea of necropolitics, which is an idea put forth by Akil Mbembe. Um, and it basically is, a, you know, about who is disposable and who is not. That is, who can live and who can die. And we know in this case that the Ukrainians, you know, were subject to death. Um, and I, you know, I think that through this, the millions of dead communicated a form of Soviet power that negated Ukrainian sovereignty by taking away the ability of Ukrainians to determine their own mortality. And this would forever shape the overall Soviet experience for many Ukrainians uh, as they, you know, for those who survived. Now, you can see on these images, um, you've probably seen a lot of Alexander Wienerberger's photos, um, one of the only photographers to capture images of the famine and his work is available online widely. The bottom photo is his and it shows a number of mass graves. So these are what they looked like. Um, and if you look closely, you can see the man standing in a grave in the back. Um, and he would have been a brigade worker who was responsible for burying these bodies. And the image at the top um, was one I found in the archives in Ukraine. And it's a, it's a drawing of mass graves by a, a 10 year old Ukrainian boy who was actually at that point living in Czechoslovakia. And so you get a sense of the toll that's being communicated through the dead um, just by these images. And I think the, the drawing by the 10 year old is remarkable for these, you know, in its own right, but uh, it communicates something to us about what death meant. Now, when you're talking about the dead, um, you know, there's a whole issue about the disposal of bodies in mass graves, which contributes to delayed forms of mourning. It strips those who died of funeral rites um, and last processions and all of these types of things. But, um, you know, although we think about confronting these bodies just in maybe the height of the famine or immediately after, um, people are confronting these remains for years to come. Uh, people secretly buried their relatives in places where the Soviets wouldn't find them. And they would go back in the late 30s and even the 1940s and, you know, rebury them in, in plots close to home. So they would confront these bodies for years and years and years. Um, and now, you know, this is these images are from 2005, but there have been efforts to, to rebury some Holodomor victims. Um, and these ones, uh, this was done in Kharkiv. So really, I see this as a a restoration of the moral order. It's attempting to confront those hauntings, the ghosts of the past, and rebury them in new ways that allow Ukrainians to, to move forward, or at least try to move forward. Um, now, there's also been the same type of reburial efforts with the 1946-47 famine in Lviv. Um, there was a massacre there in 47. It's called at the Pizamsha train station. Maybe some of you have been there. And uh, several, a lot of Ukrainians were, were murdered by the secret police trying to flee east uh, from eastern Ukraine to Lviv in order to find food. And when they got to the train station, they were massacred and they actually buried them uh, right there under the train station. And then uh, it, what, it used to be a parking lot and they dug up the remains and now have buried them at Lichakiv Cemetery. And you can see them um, there and they've reburied them with the monuments and you can go and see them. So. All this to say is that they're still confronting these remains of the Holodomor, of these victims years later, decades later, centuries later. Um, but this reburial is a, is a way to restore the moral order. And I, you know, this is still happening now, although it's happening in different ways with land rights in Ukraine. Um, cemeteries are being sold, or the, at least the land, to different contractors that are building on top of these. And there's an effort now to preserve the graves of Holodomor victims um, so they don't get, you know, plowed over for buildings and residences and things like this. So it's an issue that is still happening today. I think one of the other things that we talk about um, in the aftermath of the famine is, is how people address trauma, which has been done in the literature on the Holodomor to some degree. But I think that we need to dig a bit deeper. And this, this involves reading the work of uh, medical psychiatrists like Judith Herman and others to really understand what it means to go through something like this. So I think another way to get at the way that these legacies sort of manifest is to look at the way that family structures were challenged and destroyed. And I think that 
one example that I have here and that's in the book is from the Volkan family. And you can see some of these photographs of Nikolai Volkan. He was a photographer for, uh, from Chernihiv in the town of Baturin. Um, they're online with the whole of the more research and education consortiums photo directory. And they've made some of these photos available online, which you can see. Now, I wanna talk about him as an example of what it means to grieve and to endure loss and to, to be part of a family that ultimately becomes dysfunctional and breaks apart. Um, and it's an example of how one father struggles to process his grief after one of his size, sons dies from hunger in June of 1933. So just to give you a quick sort of overview of who this was, um, Nikolai Bokan was a photographer by trade. He had served in the Red Army for some years um, and ended up moving to Chernihiv where he'd settled down with his wife, Vaselina, and their seven children. Um, he was a devout Tolstoyan, so he had he practiced ideas of pacifism, vegetarianism, anti-smoking, commitment to a simple rural life. And this is what he decided to do, is just to run a small photography business and try and make a living. He homeschooled his children. He had seven of them, as I mentioned, because his beliefs did not align with those of the state. He did not want them to get an education by the state, so instead homeschooled them. And as you can imagine, um, not all of his children were interested in being homeschooled in the Tolstoyan belief, and this would cause issues, right? So you have some aspects of just family dynamics already, um, you know, sort of clashing before the famine even happens. And I mention this because it's important about what the famine can do and how it can latch on to pre-existing conditions. So the family's tensions grew even higher as um, hunger started to set in in the 1930s. Um, and it really began to stretch Bokan's resources very thin. Um, they had seven mouths to feed, uh, including the parents, and it was just too much. And as a result of this, one of Bokan's sons, Kostya, who's the protagonist in one of my chapters, left to work on a nearby collective farm where he thought he would at least be able to eat and get some food. Now, you can see some of these images from Bokan. Um, he not only took photographs for professional purposes, but he also took a lot of photographs of his family. And the one on the left shows them um, going 300 days without bread. And the one on the right is a farewell lunch of meager proportions, as you can see, before they send Kostya off to the collective farm. Now, the next couple of photos, you know, I, I think are a bit difficult to look at. So I just want to give you a warning in case that's a problem. Um, Kostya ends up dying in June of 1933 from malnourishment um, while working on the collective farm. But what is remarkable about his death, and you know, really every death is remarkable here, but what's remarkable about Kostya's is that his father was a photographer and was able to capture the death through his photography. Um, and it's, it, again, he's one of the few photographers uh, that was able to take photos of the famine during this time. And he used this, um, he used his lens essentially to capture the death and burial of Kostya. And you can see these here, that's Kostya laying in his coffin at the top. And on the right is um, Kostya's coffin being taken by horse and wagon to the cemetery. And of course, then the middle photo is him standing over um, his, his son's grave. Uh, and it's sort of unique because you can, I know these images are maybe a bit small in person, but um, you'll notice that Kostya has his own grave marker and it's the only one in the cemetery. And if you look behind it, there are a number of other fresh graves, which indicates that people are being buried in mass there and they're just um, sort of labeled with sticks in the ground. Um, so he's making a statement about the death of his son. He's critical of the state and he's letting people know that he died of hunger, which it says on his grave marker. It's remarkable at the time. Um, after Kostya's death, the relationships between Bokan and his remaining children took a turn for the worse. Um, and, you know, we know from his photos and his journal entries that he, um, he started to distance himself from them. His, his children started to leave in, in droves. Um, some joined collective farms, others went to work for the state, doing all the things that their father didn't want them to do. Um, and we know from his photos and from his journal entries, and he has a significant um, number of pages written in his journals that I read in the archive. And he talks very candidly about struggling to come to terms with losing a son and dealing with these family issues. Um, and it reveals something to us, I think, about the emotional toll of the famine, which is why his, his story is so critical to this. 
Um, his story is also unique because it demonstrates the ability of the famine's effects to attach on to these pre-existing family problems that existed before hunger was a real issue for them, but exacerbated their family dynamics and ended up breaking their family apart. Bokan didn't handle the death of his son very well at all. I would argue, I mean, as best as a historian can do reading the evidence, that it ruined him um, and it changed him for the rest of his life. Um, so after Costia died, he started making what I guess we can call these photo display boards, which you can see at the top. And what he was doing is he put these together to sort of piece together different moments in his life when he thought things went wrong. And he used them really to sort of call out his children. Um, and he would sometimes, we have some evidence that maybe these were displayed like on the fence or at least in some public view. So publicly shaming his children, which you can imagine didn't go over well. Uh, and he would attribute their mistakes in life to not following his belief in the Tolstoyan lifestyle and not following his orders and directions. Now, there's much to remark on about these photos. And I, I do write about this in more detail. But one thing that's consistent in all of these photo display boards, which he makes several um, all the way up until his arrest in, 19, in late 1937, is that Kostya is always among them. If you look closely, there are images of Kostya's grave, of him in the coffin. It appears on every single photo display board. So no matter what he's going through, the famine is always with him. And he becomes haunted by the presence of his dead son that he just cannot let go. Um, and this is something that really goes with him till the end of his time. And he's eventually arrested in 1937 and tried in 1938 when his photos are finally discovered. And they use this evidence against him as, you know, anti-Soviet sentiments and all these other charges. And he's sentenced with one of his other sons, who was sort of his assistant, um, to hard labor in remote parts of the Soviet Union. And Bokan would end up dying in a labor camp in 1942. But I think what's critical here is that we see that Bokan continued to return to that moment of the famine through Kostya's death over and over and over again throughout the 1930s. Um, and he, you know, he used these sort of photo display boards to tell a story about this, but he also talks a lot about it in his journal. And I think you know, this is really helpful for understanding the way that people sort of grapple with their trauma and struggle to come to terms um, with the grieving process. And he went through the grieving process in different ways. And anybody who's studied trauma and grief knows that you don't follow a simple plan. There are outlines of how it works, but people go through different stages of grief in different ways at different times and sometimes go back and forth. But looking through his evidence and his files, he was never able to complete that process of grieving. And it's significant. So this is an attempt that we see to come to terms with the evidence or to, with the toll of the famine, but he was unable to do so. Now, I'll get back to Ukraine in a minute, but I, I also want to highlight that there's an international humanitarian response to this famine that reveals uh, an international sort of legacy that exists, um, I would say, not just in Ukraine, but across Europe and across the world in the 1930s. Um, so as part of my interest in the aftermath, I was, I was drawn to the humanitarian response in part because it doesn't actually get started until about July 1933 with real earnest. Um, now, this is quite late because the worst of the famine is already over at this point. So um, that said, if, you know, I was working in the archives in, in Ukraine and in different countries with different documents from some of these aid committees. And you start to see that um, they actually are working really diligently throughout the remainder of 1933 to provide whatever help and relief they can um, all the way through 1934, which becomes a critical year, and I'll talk about that here in a minute, and even as far as 1935, and some groups as far as 1936, they're working to provide humanitarian relief. Um, but what accounts for this? That's what I kept wondering. If the famine is relatively over, um, and we know that there are lingering effects throughout the fall, and there are famine-related deaths into 1934, um, why are people working to provide aid and relief to famine victims? Um, and it becomes clear after working in these different archives in multiple countries that what was clear in almost every set of documents is that they all feared that there was another famine coming. For them, 1933 was the beginning, not the end. They thought that what they had seen in 1933 was going to manifest into something equal or greater in 1934 and even in 1935. 
Now, there was evidence of this um, due to reports coming out of Ukraine of low crop productions, of unfavorable weather, of people still dying from hunger-related causes, including disease. And, um, you know, the spread of disease is an issue that uh, authorities work to control um, for, for months and years after the famine as well, but I don't have time to talk about that here. But the sphere of future famine penetrates um, widely. Now, I included this photo here from uh, an exhibition that took place in Paris, Paris, France, in May of 1934. And it's a bit grainy, but what it depicts is an exhibition of Ukrainian artifacts that are being bid on. And it's part of a, a famine relief um, program that's going on in May 1934. And they're raising money to send to Ukrainian famine victims. Um, and it's quite interesting because it tells us a lot that already in May of 1934, so a year after sort of the height of the famine or a year since that, um, there are still relief efforts going on in full force. Now, if, you, if you've read about the famine, you know it's a well-known fact that the Soviet authorities um, blocked international humanitarian aid. Big organizations like the Red Cross were not allowed to come into Ukraine and provide help. Um, and this is because the Soviets denied that a famine was even occurring. So you can't allow aid into Ukraine when there's no famine. That was their thinking. Um, but despite this, there were several individuals and groups and organizations that mobilized to provide smaller amounts of help. This was in no way designed to be able to help all those who needed it. But groups did sort of um, get going and work together. Now, the main groups doing this, I would sort of break down into three categories. And that is Ukrainian immigrant communities spread across Europe. Uh, religious groups and organizations, and various NGOs. Now, some of these had prior experience during the 1921-22 famine of providing aid. Not all of them worked to, to try and do things in 32-33, but some of them had that experience and uh, mobilized to, to provide help that they could. They would send things through Torxine, um, where people could exchange their valuables for the goods, or they would send individual packages that would sometimes get to people in Ukraine and give them some life-saving aid. There is evidence of that. But um, the fear of more famine was really a critical legacy that was spreading among these groups. And you can see a picture here of what was the Interfaith um, Commission led by Cardinal Theodor Initzer of Vienna, um, who convened a group of uh, religious professionals in December of 1933 to begin work on providing aid. Uh, there were also other efforts by Metropolitan Andrei Shaptitsky, and you also have the Vatican. There's a book of documents on what the Vatican knew about the famine. because They were paying attention to the religious persecution happening in the Soviet Union at the time. And they also knew about the famine. Um, and in reading some of these documents, actually, one of my favorite sort of uh, revelations was I saw just a snippet in a sentence, which is the beauty of working you know, in physical archives and actually you know, hands-on documents. You find things by accident. But they... Um, I saw something about the Archbishop of Canterbury supplying aid to Ukraine. And so I went to London and worked in the Church of England archives. And sure enough, there's a whole book of all kinds of famine related things about what the Archbishop of, Can of Canterbury, who at the time was Cosmo Gordon Lang, what he and the Church of England knew. Now, they didn't really help out a whole lot. They were monitoring the religious persecution as well, but they were having, um, they were hosting speakers and, and politicians and people who had traveled in and out of Ukraine to come and give evidence to them about what has happened. And it was quite an interesting sort of find for me to realize that, um, you know, religious groups all across the world knew about what was going on. But it's in those, those documents where somebody writes a letter to the archbishop, um, and this is in 1934, warning them of the greater catastrophe to come, which is, you know, a pull quote that I pulled from that archive. Um, but I think what it hints at is that this fear of future famine was really deep. Um, there was, of course, German propaganda that was relying on uh, the famine to sort of expose the Soviet Union. And so they're spreading this fear in a certain way. Uh, but there is a real fear based on what had happened in 1933, that things were going to be much worse in 1934 and even 1935. So now let's go back inside the borders of what was then Soviet Ukraine. I think that... Um, it's important to understand how people still work to grapple with the ruptures that were caused by the famine in the 1930s. And it's really hard to do this because the evidence is scant and it takes a lot of time of working in different archives, especially in Ukrainian archives. And um, I, I was there working and had plans to work in 
set of you know uh, n- numerous regional archives in the spring of 2022, which of course could not happen because of the full scale invasion. So um, what I'm about to talk about, I think, is going to be you know even strengthened by those who can do more work when it's possible in these regional archives. But one thing that I accidentally came across, again, the, the privilege of working in person. Um, I was working at the SBAU archive in Kyiv, and I was, I was, I had, you know, been alerted uh, by some people to some documents that I wanted to read, and I accidentally came across a case file that I, I didn't mean to order, but I did. Um, and I sort of just browsed through it quickly, and I ended up finding, um, I, I saw the word hold uh, in one of the documents, and I was, you know, immediately drawn to that, to, to famine. Uh, and it turned out that there was a poem about the famine in there. And so I was reading it and I found it to be pretty extraordinary because, you know, I was like, wow. And it was from 1936. It's like, wow, people are talking and writing about famine when it couldn't be talked about. This is interesting. But I thought it was a one-off. Um, so I went back to the archive and started working with more of these files from the same time period. I was able to piece together some other evidence uh, about where I might be able to find these things. And sure enough, I found a number of files of students in their late teens and 20s that were writing poetry about the famine from the time of like the height of the famine from roughly like May 1933 all the way till 1937. So there was a number of you know years in the remaining 1930s where people are actually talking about this. Um, and the ones that I was able to work with came from students who are from central and eastern Ukraine. And these, you know, the responses are shaped by the archive, of course. I wanted to work in other archives because I have a feeling that more poems are out there. Um, But what I came to realize after reading these is that poems are important mediums for writing about the famine because they, you know, they could say what could not necessarily be said out loud. You could write it down and you could still work through what was going on. Um, But there's evidence, too, in these files that these students at their different technical and pedagogical institutions were also creating informal poetry clubs where they were sharing their poems about the famine with each other and debating them. Now, this evidence comes from criminal files, which take a special reading. Um, You can't read someone's life through a criminal file. It's very problematic, but you can glean insights about what was going on. So it is a a line of inquiry that should be studied further. And, you know, uh, perhaps a student who's wanting to work on the whole of the more can go back and sort of look at the way that these things are being talked about publicly. And I came across other files where people are talking about the famine at work and all these other things. So I think it's worthwhile to, to, you know, to consider. But what these poems really do is they offer alternative narratives about 1932-33 that challenge the state's denial and interpretation of events and highlighted what it meant, really, from a survivor's point of view, to bear witness to collectivization, terror, violence, humiliation, starvation. And the poems that I read all sort of work along these, these lines and talk about these different themes. Um... The poems that I have, uh, and I I just wrote about some of these in a recent article that you can read in the Russian Review. It's a special issue on rupture, and I I go into some of these poems and and analyze them, is um, they highlight the individual and collective experiences of suffering during the famine. And really what they do is they employ vocabularies of pain that assisted survivors in, I would argue, transforming the unsufferable, overwhelming, and really traumatic experiences of the famine into language that represented their understanding and their experiences. So poem is poems are a way for them to express and sort of come to terms with the things that they saw to document it in real time and to work through some of these pains that had stuck with them for years. Now, the Holodomor and, you know, the repressions of the later 30s, which, you know, problematically is termed the Great Terror because there is terror that's happening for Ukrainians much before this, um, become linked here. Now, if you're thinking about how people process events, um, we need to think about the silencing that happened um, didn't allow Ukrainians to process and come to terms with the, what they had lived through after the famine. But when they start to do this, despite that silencing, um, you have another rupture with the Great Terror that then starts to make criminals out of those people who are working to come to terms with the famine. So it's not a surprise that you know the SBU archive and secret police files are filled with um, evidence and, and files of people that um, were arrested and tried for talking about the famine and expressing sentiments about the famine and writing about the famine in all these different ways. But nonetheless, um, there's a link here that creates a sequence of ruptures, I would say, that stifled the ability to process the famine. And it is why I sort of end in the 1930s uh, in my, th- in my, my book, 
Um, I really had planned to take this to the through the 1946-47 famine to look at this aftermath in greater detail, but it becomes a bit much and it, it's problematic because you then have to enter the territory of talking about um, how people are processing the famine during World War II, during the Holocaust, during the Nazi occupation that in the 40s that brings a set of uh, smaller hungers and famines and then reoccupied by the Soviets and then another famine in 46, 47. So it's a worthwhile task, but it's a whole separate book and requires, um, I would say, much more interrogation of how this sort of memory of the famine is then you know, changed and, and shaped by those events that come after the 1930s. So to conclude, since I've gone a few minutes over time, I'm sorry. Um, I think that there's relevance to today. So in October of, to, uh, 2022, um, this is after the full-scale invasion, of course, uh, Russian occupiers in the city of Mariupol, who, have, you know, the city is now um, infamous for being besieged, and if you haven't seen 20 Days in Mariupol, I encourage you to do so, and I think that there's a screening coming up here soon, which Natalia Shvilova is leading. Um, I encourage you to see this film. Um, Russian occupiers in that city uh, decided to destroy the Holodomor monument in October. Uh, and they claim that it represented disinformation at the state level. Their contention was that um, the Holodomor did not happen, it wasn't a real event, and therefore there shouldn't be a monument to it. And what they did is they dis disassembled this, and you can see the picture of them doing this here behind me. They disassembled this and decided to break it down and use it for building construction materials. So what they did is they played the Russian line that's been here all along. By denying the whole Holodomor, the they denied Ukraine's history. By denying Ukraine's history, they denied Ukraine's existence. Um, and this is a narrative that Putin famously talked about uh, in several of his speeches, July of 21, February of 22. And it's the same line of thinking um, that has existed throughout this full-scale invasion. So this past year in 2023, we marked 90 years of the whole Holodomor, um, a somber occasion. Um, the famine and the Russo-Ukrainian War are very different events and have their own context and their own histories, but they're starting to share similar legacies. Um, and I know I'm not the first to make this point, but I think it's worth reiterating. Uh, there are parallels here. Uh, we're once again witnessing, you know, corporal confrontations on a mass scale. Um, civilians are dying in mass, so are soldiers, and people are having to deal with um, a rise in dead bodies, and they have to confront them. Um, we have mass graves again in 2022, in 2023. And this is an example of municipal workers in Mariupol disposing of bodies in a mass grave again. Um, and I've been told that you can even see the changes in Ukraine's geography on Google Earth if you go to those cities uh, and look at what's happened. You know, there's an environmental history of this to be written as well. So we have this issue of bodies again, this issue of mass graves, um, this issue of trauma, people are experiencing trauma as they go through this war. Uh, there's people using poetry to, again, work through their emotions and understanding of the war. Amelia Glazer and her colleagues have done a wonderful job of creating this online archive of Ukrainian war poetry that you can, I think they're going to release it soon, but it captures these poems of, of war in real time and how poetry is being used to work through the experiences that people are feeling in Ukraine right now. There's obviously um, the effect of the war in the international arena, just like there was resonance of the whole of the war in the international arena in the 30s. Um, and arguably, it is perhaps uh, of, of more importance now, this war, especially with what's going on in our own political system, as we work to see if a bill will pass to support Ukrainian aid further. Um, and there are fears about what might happen with this war in the future. Uh, the war is far from over. Sir, he's given us a great uh, book on the origins of what's happened and has taken us up to as close to the present as one could. Um, but the, the narrative of this war is very much open um, and we don't know what's coming next. So what I will finish with is that episodes of genocide and war and mass violence have very long afterlives that continue to impact long after the event itself is finished. Um, so these difficult pasts, they really do not pass easily or perhaps ever go away. And you know, we could we could talk about that. Um, and you know, I, I wish I had a, a happier note to end on, but what I can tell you is that we need to prepare ourselves for the processing that is to come with this war whenever it ends. So thank you.
Um, uh, thank you very much, John. It's it's uh, quite impressive on a number of levels, from from emotional to academic one. And um, I, I have a comment and question, and then I'll uh, turn. Uh, basically, we will start Q and A. I have um, a couple of comments and questions from uh, online. Uh, a person named Matt Foley, who you just mentioned here, uh, wrote, well done, John. So I certainly, <laughs> I certainly, I certainly agree with that, with that um, uh, assessment. Again, thank you very much. So first comment, and um, the, you, you described the international aid and international reaction that they were uh, First of all, get into this whole whole game in a major way quite late. By the time famine was the, the, the most uh, difficult, the most damaging part of it was over. And then that they were expecting that there would be new famines. And uh, a couple of things uh, that we learned while working on the uh, famine module of uh, the MAPA Digital Atlas project was that what demographers are telling us that the famine didn't end in 1933. And really in the first half of 1934, according to demographic data, the famine continues. And um, we still don't know what to make out of it, whether the famine really continues on, 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 in a very significant way, or this is just the uh, way how the, the, the Soviet statistics worked and they were trying to, to account for losses of the early period, uh, really cooking the books for 1934. But that's that's just one uh, thing that the, really the famine doesn't end in 1933, at least according to some data. Another is that the famine of 1933 is not the first famine not just generally in Ukraine, but that in central part of Ukraine, where the the um, losses are the, the biggest, the, the this is a continuation of famine of 1932. So, in a sense, that um, uh, what what the, the the Western perspective was, uh, it was very late, but maybe by 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 accident, it wasn't completely out of touch because that's that's what we see. 33 famine really follows the famine of 32, and then we have continuation in 34. So th those are the comments. Um, and the question is um, <clears throat> whether the uh, SBO materials that you worked with, so maybe some other documents, uh, would allow you to, to make some uh, not conclusions, of course, but some some uh, developed hypothesis about what was the interpretation of the famine per se. Because my understanding is that uh, people didn't, or people on the ground didn't create a new term. They, they were using the term Holodomor, so, sorry, Holod Holodivka or Holod, Holodomor basically became a, an academic term or, or political term. Later and whether they distinguish between this famine and others, they, they, they survived many other famines. So, what what were the the, the, the interpretations? And when it comes to explanation or blame, mm -hmm. where where did they point their finger? Yeah, thank you for the question and for the comments, and thanks to to Matt uh, for for the nice the nice comment online. Um, so. I think that working with SBU materials, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I was just getting started before I had to leave due to the full scale war. Uh, and there's more material that I want to consult. Um, but I think what we learn from these, these files is that um, they do know, they're referencing 33 specifically. Um, it's in the documents. And I think that one thing that the files that I worked with with these students is that was the very issue in some of these poems is that they were writing about who was responsible for the famine actually. And that these were the disagreements between the students in the poetry club. Um, one set was blaming Stalin without naming him. Um, others were blaming local officials and perpetrators. 
uh, which is work that is being done by Daria Mattingly right now on local perpetrators and their role in all this, which is really important. Um, so we do have a sense that um, they're talking about 33 specifically. You'll read in the interrogation reports about why did you reference 33? And in the poems, it talks about the great hunger, you know, the bleak in 33. Um, sometimes they do talk about 32, 33. It is written that way in some of the files of 32, 33, which, you know, of course, it's hard to distinguish what they're talking about sometimes. And they're not always talking specifically just about going hungry, but about the events that lead to the hunger, policies of collectivization, uh, the search brigades that are coming through and taking everything. Um, but I would assume that a lot of that comes from how we sort of normally bracket the whole Demore now, which is like November 1932, you know, to the end of the famine in 33 in the summer. Uh, and I think this is when the policies, you know, of course, this becomes the whole Demore. It's what Stanislav Kluczynski labels um, in his, you know, this really great piece that he wrote in 2010 in a small academic journal in Ukraine that I think more people should read, but it, it's called Ukrainska Selo Pisla Hol of the Moru. And it's just a very short article, but really gets at these sort of uh, delineate, delineations of, of a temporal time with the famine and how people are perceiving this. So I think that the files in the SBU um, help us start to understand people are making sense of it and do know who to blame. Um, they are blaming, you know, of course, some of the local perpetrators who regrettably are some of their neighbors or, you know, their work associates that are working for the state and taking things from them. Um, but there is a widespread consensus, at least what and I read, uh, that they know these policies are being directed from Moscow to Ukraine and that they're being targeted specifically. And um, some of the interrogation reports, and again, you have to read these with a fine tooth comb and to not read one's life. Uh, and a lot of times they're being forced to admit things in these interrogations, of which they go through several, by the way. Uh, it's never just one. Uh, and they do this and they repetitively ask questions and you really get to know the, the secret police through this. Um, you know, they do blame, uh, none of them will ever say like, you know, directly who was at blame, but they sort of hint at it. Uh, and they're very clear that um, Ukraine specifically was targeted and oppressed. So there is, I think, some knowledge already about, you know, who was to blame, at least in a, a general sense, if that makes sense. Well, thank you very much. And, and you're saying that the, the term Great Famine, Veliki Holod, is already present in the 1930s? They're using the term Holod all the time. It, it, at least the people in some of this, you know, the, that are writing letters or writing poems or talking about the famine at work. Um, there's a, actually a, a case file that I have. I didn't talk about it here, but um, I think it's from 1937 or 1938. This guy went, he used to drive a tractor on a collective farm and he used to do tours through the villages afterward. And he went to work and was telling everybody about what he saw. Uh, and, and he was talking about all the dead bodies that he had come across and the smells of them emanating in the homes in the village, uh, alerting them to all the, you know, the, the horrors that accompanied the famine. And, um, he, you know, he uses the term holod and all kinds of things very directly. So that language is being used despite, you know, supposedly not being able to use it at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you very much. And, and I recall reading one of the diaries from that time is someone written by by a young person who is a really believer in, in, in socialist transformation. We see that from his diary and the last the, the, the last entry in the diary is Prokleta Pyatirichka, the damn five year plan. So basically blaming particular sort of policies versus versus maybe again either Stalin or, or, or local officials. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Um, so again, I uh, I invite all of you to, to ask questions and I will try to go back and forth between the one people present online and people present here. Yes, please. Um, hi, John. Thank hi. you very much for this fascinating talk. Um, I was wondering uh, about the time frame of your research and whether you are interested in the testimonies of people who somehow directly experienced uh, the, the Holodomor, or have you been also thinking about looking at, the, for example, transgenerational uh, trauma? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that, Eva. Thanks for coming. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I'm interested. I One of the things to get at some of these issues uh, is that you have to read testimonies of survivors and there's quite a bit and you know these can be problematic too but um i think that they're a really a valuable source if you know how to read them and work through them and compare them to one another right um you get out a lot of things that the archival records archives in ukraine or elsewhere won't tell you about the famine 
and that's deliberate. Uh, so yes, of course, I'm interested in that. And what was your second question about, oh, inter, uh, transgenerational trauma. So I think that one thing that really strikes me about Holodomor studies is there have been some really good works on issues of transgenerational trauma and suffering um, and even epigenetic changes, which really haven't been studied since the Dutch famine or the hunger winter in the 40s, uh, or perhaps uh, the Irish famine, the Gertemore, uh, or other famines. But I think what struck me and why I want to stay in the 1930s or why I was at least drawn to it is it's a time when everybody says no one was handling the famine, no one was talking about it, nobody could say anything. And it's just, I, I saw evidence that spoke a little bit differently. It's not that things weren't being silenced, but I think we also have to make room and understand how Ukrainians were working to come to terms with it, and they still were. So um, I am interested in the transgenerational thing, uh, but this takes a particular study, and there's a great, um, I think it was an East West Journal of Ukrainian Studies or another journal by a couple of researchers who work on that. Um, the transgenerational stuff starts to get away from the survivors and uh, you know those who were actually in the event. And I think it's really worthwhile. It's just not quite what I'm interested in at this point, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, wonderful. So I'm going online and then I will return to the people in the audience. So a question is from um, Sarah Somers. Is this similar to how international aid was offered during Chinese famine of the 1870s? And the question came at the time when you were talking about, uh, about the, the international aid. Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a little bit far afield from my knowledge about what the uh, distribution of aid was in the Chinese famine. Um, it certainly, I can tell you, marks a difference from what happened in 1921, 22, where there's a much more robust international response. Um, although there's been, there's been some work that's you know sort of challenging this of how much Ukraine actually received during all of that in the 20s. But I will say that um, there actually was a history in the Russian empire of, there was a series of famines in the 18th and 19th centuries of which the government actually responded and played a role in helping feed their people. So there was a precedent at some point in time of at least providing some aid, at least stepping in, at least acknowledging what was going on. Um, but this is a major break in policy, obviously, in the 30s. Um, you know, and of course, Lenin famously asked Ukraine for, for to provide aid to the starving uh, territories in the 21-22 famine. Uh, they knew of, you know, the significance of Ukraine uh, as, you know, the breadbasket of Europe, as it's been called. But, um, you know, when Ukraine needed help in the 30s, obviously, it wasn't given anything. Uh, so as far as the Chinese famine, I'm not sure. But uh, definitely, you can read um, the work of, you know, uh, others like uh, who have studied the Chinese famine and would know better about that than I. I'm not sure. Okay, thank you very much. So, Tom, and then after I go back, then I'll turn back to the focus. Thank you very much, John. We've learned a lot from it, and we'll learn more when we get a book in our hands. Um, I have a comment and a question. First of all, about a quarter of a mile away from here on, Bo on Cambridge Common, there's a a striking famine memorial there, to, but it's not the hollow of the Lord's to the Irish, great Irish famine of 1845 and 47. It's just this side of the monuments to Kosciuszko and Pulaski for their roles in the Revolutionary War. Um, uh, but the, the, the question is this, and it, if, if you could please go back to the slides numbered one, three and one, four of the graves. Uh, the mass graves. Sure. I'm going to get that pulled up. Yeah. Uh, one, one's a photograph and one's a drawing. You want to go? Yeah, yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Um, the. The presence of crosses in the drawing is striking and their absence in the photograph is equally striking. Um, do you, can you tell us anything about whether or not the crosses in, in, that were, appeared on both of these graves were allowed to remain there undisturbed or would they have been removed uh, in a desecration of the grave by the authorities of an officially atheist country? Um, yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for the reminder about the the monument to the Irish famine. Um, there's a reason that there's my class there every semester. Yeah, there's there's a lot of solidarity between the Irish and Ukrainians, and there's a great book that actually compares the Gertemore and the Holodomor, um, and it, it it's a great book. Um, so as far as this drawing goes, 
there definitely wouldn't have been crosses on top of the mass graves. Um, this was added probably for effect of oh. this. This is um, a sort of that. Yeah, this, this drawing comes from a special edition book published by a children's home for children who didn't have parents or uh, lost parents um, in Czechoslovakia. Uh, and it's unclear who this 10-year-old is if he came from Ukraine because of the famine. Um, one would think that, yes, it is because he's, you know, the whole issue of this little book that they put together is about the suffering of the famine. And so he drew his interpretation, I imagine, of what mass graves looked like and to, you know, Probably had the cross to dictate that it in fact was a mass grave otherwise it maybe it wouldn't be clear what he was doing so no um if there were markers they were likely taken down which is why Bokan, the the father who was grieving is so interesting because he put his own grave marker up in a cemetery where there was no others and it's unclear how long that was able to stay up i imagine that authorities and others took that down pretty soon um but no, these crosses wouldn't have been there. And that's what makes it so hard to, to find all these mass graves is they're not well marked. Um, in some villages, there are, if you go to Ukraine, there are gates around some of them, um, you know, and there's little signs that say like, this is a mass grave. Um, and because it's been so long now, the, the ground settles, uh, it's always hard to know. But um, if you're interested in learning more about this, there's an app that you can download from the app store called Track Hold More History. And it locates a uh, number of burial grounds across Ukraine. Um, but it, it's actually designed to be a walking tour that you have in your hand as you walk through Kyiv, and you can see um, the mass graves that exist uh, all around the city. And so I, I didn't put pictures of them up here, but I visited a number of these sites through that app uh, walking around um, where I lived at the time in Podil. Um, so you can go still to this day and visit sites where underneath you are going to be victims of the whole Thanks. Um, thank you very much. So uh, um, and the question is, next question online is from Melinda Herring, and the question is, great presentation, John. You said that you're interested in looking at the ripples that the Holodomor caused. What ripples do you see in modern Ukraine? Short time horizons or the abundance of food in most homes, question mark. Love to hear anything you have uncovered. Looking forward to your book. Yeah. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, Nice to, nice to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in. So, yeah, I mean, I think one of the key legacies, if you've spent any sort of time in Ukraine, is you know that um, there's no wasted food, um, particularly bread. Uh, everything is preserved. Um, these are legacies that, you know, I, I talked to my Ukrainian friends and colleagues that are my age that never understood why they did that. And because their grandparents who lived through the famine often wouldn't talk about it. And so it was just like, you know, we, we maintain um, a full fridge. We always have food on the table. You know, we always supply our guests with a number of, you know, options to eat, which you can get very full very quickly when you visit houses in Ukraine. Uh, you have great feasts, but this is a result of not having anything for so long. And it's not just the whole of the more. It's a series of hungers and and shortages that come after that as well in the 20th century. And so the ripple effects now, I think, you know, I think they've sort of, I don't want to say changed, but maybe evolved because of the war. Um, there's a number of texts that are talking about, or, you know, articles that mention the whole of the war. I think one thing that's sort of ironic is um, in Putin waging this war, attempting to, you know, sort of um, make Ukraine not exist, or at least claim that it doesn't exist. He's actually drawn a, a ton of attention to Ukraine, in which people are now learning more than ever about the whole of the war. Um, and I think that people are starting to understand just how badly these people suffered. So I think it's become an identity marker more than ever now um, that it's an important part of Ukrainian history and it always has been. But I think Ukrainians themselves are, are even you know, grappling with this more and starting to ask, well, how did my family survive? What were the horrors that they went through? Um, and, and these types of things. So I would say like, these are sort of some of the ripple effects that are there now. Um, you know, The other thing, and I mentioned it just briefly is uh, if you're paying attention to sort of like civil society disputes um, in, in cities like Kyiv, um, there's all these sort of battles about maintaining historical residences and buildings and um, land developers wanting certain lands. Well, this applies elsewhere, too. And there's a number of people that are fighting to preserve these cemeteries that hold mass graves. Um, and so this is a ripple effect, too. The Holdemar is still present, and we ha they haven't fully grappled with the repercussions of this event even 90 years later. And now they're fighting to preserve this by keeping, you know, contractors and land developers at bay. Uh, and these are ways that they're confronting the Holodomor, I would say. And I, there are probably a number of others, but, um, you know, I leave that to the Ukrainians to tell you what that is. 
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, uh, it was really striking to see um, how the um, ongoing war um, during the war, the Russian state is trying to deny the Great Famine again. But um, I, I was wondering whether you have seen any um, discussions um, about the Great Famine uh, between the collapse of the Soviet Union um, and you know, uh, you know, Putin's presidency. You know, um, like, have, have you seen any um, Russian officials or intellectuals, including the dissenting ones, um, discussing the Great Famine within Russia? Or mm. um, no? Um, I mean, generally, no. It, it's not talked about. Uh, it's it's a conversation that's a non-starter in most places in Russia. I mean, those who have dissented uh, and those you know Russian intellectuals. Uh, that have been very supportive of Ukraine are the ones that also knew about the famine and probably had family members who maybe, you know, lived through the all-union famine too, which is, you know, a wider famine that's a little bit separate from the whole of the more. Uh, so they know about these things and I would say generally would have just already been supportive because of their stance on Ukraine. The only time that you hear about the famine is, you know, they attribute it to, you know, it's the, the same argument that you hear over the Ukrainian Nazis. It's a, you know, it's a Ukrainian nationalist invention. Um, and so they, they'll they only invoke it to deny it, if that makes sense. Uh, and this is sort of what Russia has been doing all along, um, not just with the Holodomor, but it's a central, you know, because it's central to Ukraine's, you know, national memory. It's uh, central to the development really as a country because there are repercussions from the whole of the war in the years after. I mean, it affects the agricultural policies of the whole Soviet Union for years to come. Um, and they never really solved the issue uh, of the repercussions of being able to feed people properly, actually, because of the famine. So um, it being discussed in Russia, I not that I know of, and I would probably say probably not at all unless it's being denied, but I could be wrong. And um, in fact, if there were discussions of the whole war going on in Russia, uh, we should encourage them <laughs> so people can learn about it. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going back to online and then and then Jenny will be next here in the room. So the question is from Susan Smith Peter and uh, she writes fascinating presentation John. Thanks. Are there differences between how the Holodomor was commemorated in Ukraine and in the diaspora? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Susan, thanks. Uh, thanks for tuning in. It's nice to have a lot of friends in the audience. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the commemorations in the diaspora started much early, much earlier. Um, you know, there's already people like Milena Rudnitska, who was part of a, a group working in Lviv to provide famine aid, uh, you know, early on wrote in the 50s and in, in uh, Svoboda, you know, a diaspora paper in the US about the struggles to actually deliver aid. And so the diaspora was already marking these occasions. Um, those who ended up in Germany after the famine and after World War II, um, there's actually an image, I forget from what German town in 1948, I think, where they actually erect um, a grave and it's it's a grave, it's like a float parade looking thing that you know is in commemoration of the millions who died during the famine. So they're commemorating it already in the 40s. Um, and then there's, there are, of course, in North America, in Canada, especially, but also the US, there are marches um, to commemorate the, the famine. Um, they do a number of work. They play a number of roles in the 1980s to help get these investigative commissions to start investigating the famine, um, which is you know a whole other discussion. So they're commemorating it much earlier. But in Ukraine, um, you know, they're commemorating it probably more privately. Uh, of course, after the famine, the time period that I'm talking about. Um, but this changes, I would say, you know, in the 2000s with the Holodomor memory laws enacted under Yushchenko, um, where, you know, denying the Holodomor became sort of, I think, illegal, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to deny it. And there are a number of events that, you know, take place, commemorations. There's the installation of the Holodomor Museum, which I'm not exactly sure what year that was that was um, put up. So it, it takes a little bit longer in Ukraine, but, um, you know, there are various reasons for this. Thank you very much. Um, uh, your... John, thank you for the presentation uh, and uh, probably uh, uh, not, not very factual questions, uh, but uh, methodological, it's like um, uh, coming from the person writing, to the person writing the book <laughs> um, and more probably more about the book. So uh, you concentrate on the aftermath as the uh, core of your story. Um, what the 
um, how do you treat sources in this in this, uh, in this case? Because obviously state sources are scarce to say the least. And uh, where do you go? Where you know, what are you looking at? Because um, usually in Ukrainian historiography, when we talk about the aftermath, we talk about the historic uh, demographers and historians uh, basically beating each other to death on the numbers. Mm -hmm. And you probably following the like. Um, the whole defamation suits happen, yeah. happening around Ukraine between people who claim 10 million or people who claim 4 million. Right. And, and it had been going for about 15 years since the inaction of the uh, of the laws. Um, and the second question is more about this cost of the past, uh, of, uh, cost of the pa uh, past um, concept, which is also uh, very interesting on the personal level on, and on the family level, and like, uh, how do you treat that? Is it that is it going with the, in the Leo of like these um, early two thousands historical of subjectivities in the Soviet Union? Because like, it seems like the diaries and poems of girls fall there, mm -hmm. and like, how do you treat mythologically this? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Jenya. Um, leave it to the the grad students uh, to ask the toughest questions. Um, I appreciate them though; they're great. So. You know, one of the, I think one of the reasons that there aren't more books on the time period I'm writing about is because of the source issue. Mm -hmm. um, there are few and far between, and you have to learn to get creative in how you read sources. Um, I don't mean that you have to get creative in order to invent narratives, um, but you have to look for things that may, you know, um, are difficult to find essentially. And th that's why I, I talked about in the beginning, um, Ukrainian historiography, of course, one has to deal with and insert themselves in because there's so much written about the famine now. And especially by our Ukrainian colleagues, which I just want to reiterate, you know, and um, my, my mentors briefly at, you know, the Institute of History in Kiev, you know, people like Hanadi Boryak, uh, Oksana Yurkova, Larissa Yakubova, Stanislav Kulchitsky, um, which I still have some of his books. I need to give him back from his office when I can get back to Ukraine. Um, you know, they've written so much, and I, I wish that, you know, Western academics would read more of the Ukrainian stuff that's been written. It just isn't always the case, unfortunately, and so I hope this changes. Um, but, you know, going in and, and looking for these sources, again, like trying to figure out what it means to confront bodies. You have to read a lot of testimonies because they're not always going to show up everywhere. But then when you start looking at diplomatic reports from, you know, embassies that are in Ukraine and these people are taking trips to the countryside, um, bodies litter reports of what's going on. Um, and you, you have to start being creative in how you look for these and what it meant to people, um, which of course is difficult. And I think, you know, reading testimonies is its own art. Um, look to Lawrence Langer's books on how to read testimonies. I, you know, I, I would start there, it's very helpful. Um, and then of course, you know, there's the question of how to read state files. Uh, which are scarce and have a bias. And, you know, I follow, I'm, I'm in this lineage of studying with people like Matt Pauly, who worked with, you know, Karomia, um, who know really well how to work with these sources. And I'm of the belief that these, these SPU documents reveal a lot more about the state than they do about the people that, you know, are being arrested. Um, it, it gets these anxieties of the, the authorities who are, you know, trying to silence the things that they don't want to be told. Um, that's why you have to sort of be careful with these big conclusions that you draw. Um, and, you know, you, you sort of glean the insights from the evidence that's in the file. So, for example, the fact that these poems were in the file gave me proof that those, you know, individuals actually were writing them. And you can, you can read their journals and evidence to sort of piece together these lives and uh, come up with some interpretation. Yeah, and then the issue of, of ghosts of the past, um, you know, I, I borrow from a number of, of works, Avery, you know, Avery Gordon's work on, on haunting, um, Christina Sharp's book, In the Wake, she talks about the orthography of the wake, which is also about, you know, the Black experience. Um, and it's actually, I sort of stole her title for my title of the book, if it stays that way, uh, about it, what it means to be in the wake. And it is about subjectivity, but I mean, that's what I wanted to get out uh, in writing this is not only am I writing about the aftermath, but it's critical for me to write about people and the way that they're dealing with things. And these happen in very subjective and different ways. Um, and that's hard to capture the sort of differences in this. So it does belong to that subjectivity argument a little bit. Um, but there are also, I think, things that group these people together and the experiences that you also have to consider. Um, and then there are these bigger legacies, which you know I called here the ghosts of the past that do continue to haunt. Um, and so that's where I go with that. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Understood. 
thank you. I feel like I will have to uh, combine some of the questions, so basically give you more than one question at the same time from online. There is, uh, by the way, um, uh, those who don't uh, are not on Zoom, I inform you there is very active live happening out there and people exchange links and comments and so on and so forth, which is, I, I'll try to bring it and, and to make it part of our conversation as well, but so that you would know that there is this other reality happening there related to ours, but in, 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 in some cases more real, in, in other cases less real than the reality here. So uh, the the uh, I will combine uh, or put together more than one question. So the first one comes from uh, Tony Baldinger. Uh, I, sorry for for probably mispronouncing uh, the name. Uh, the question is: How about effects on loss of population, skills, talents, etc.? And Deborah Kelly has a question. How might you relate the last in, uh, in, in press and attempts to heal from the Holodomor with responses to present massacre of people inside Ukraine? And Deborah Kelly, a little bit later, asks also a question whether you follow forward right in Ukraine now. Uh, so that is that is certainly related to the to the present the present massacres and tragedies in mm -hmm. Ukraine. Yeah, thank you for these great questions. Um, so I, in, in my work, I don't necessarily grapple directly with the issue of demographic numbers. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, first and foremost, I, there's already been great work done on this. Um, there are a number of scholars who have done excellent work, people like Ola Volovina, Natalia Lubchuk, others who have put together these sort of transnational teams of demographers that have really studied these numbers and grappled um, you know, with how many millions of people died, which is always in contention after, you know, events like, you know, genocidal famines and events of mass violence, it's hard to know how many people died. Um, and there's, you know, there are great chapters, you can read their work in different journals. And there's also a great chapter in this book after the whole of that talks about this. And it is a current debate going on in Ukraine, um, a very serious one, uh, and one that's gotten quite ugly and that's still ongoing. So you can follow this information on social media as well. So I don't actually write about that um, distinctively. And the other reason for that is I, I, I worry when we get into these numbers debates um, that we actually start reducing the experience of the individuals by not talking about the individuals and their subjective experiences of the famine, which is what I'm interested in. It's not to say that we shouldn't study the demography or know or understand the numbers of how many people died. We absolutely should because every life matters. It's just not what is of interest in my sort of study of the aftermath because I really want to highlight the sort of social and individual cultural experiences of Ukrainians um, and sort of, you know, of course, not give them agency by any means. I, I don't do that. They already have it and have done this, you know, this, this, these acts of healing after the famine, but to highlight the work that they did do to come to terms with the famine. So I don't talk about numbers beyond um, there is some stuff in the book that, you know, in the poems reference, like, you know, millions died in 33 so it wasn't actually a concern to a lot of these people how many millions had died at that time. They were just trying to survive, get enough to eat and recover. Um, you know, those who had the privilege of some distance from the famine are the ones that are really concerned with the issues of how many died. But the work has been done on that, in my opinion, and really good work um, that's continuing to evolve. Now, um, talking about healing and, you know, the war in Ukraine now, I would say for one, um, the healing has never had a full chance to to come to fruition after the famine. We're still dealing with this. And if anything, I think the war has reopened whatever wounds were partially scabbed over. Uh, and this is making it harder to heal once again. There's a new generation learning about the whole of the more. I mean, most, if not all of these survivors are gone. Uh, that's the other reality. Uh, we don't have many survivors left to talk about these things, which is why documenting these experiences is so important. So I, I worry that um, the healing is not happening for the whole of the more, and especially now because people are just trying to survive a war and you know to live their lives. But um, perhaps there will be some lessons from the way that Ukrainians attempted to heal after the famine that people of the war will find useful in you know sort of being able to voice uh, the pain and trauma and work to come to terms with what happens whenever that is possible. And yes, I am you know as as the poets are concerned, um, I've started following uh, a lot of 
you know, poems that are being written, sung by people in this room um, who share their poetry on Facebook and other places uh, and that are being archived by people, like I said earlier, Amelia Glazer, who's, you know, it's, um, collected these poems into an archive that's going to be available soon as sort of a digital humanities tool that is um, collecting these experiences of war in real time. So I am following them, but I imagine that others are, you know, well, for sure others are doing this with more rigor um, and, you know, sort of academic precedent. Uh, thank you very much. And it looks like you answered actually even more questions than I was able to, to read because the, there is one question is exactly about, about the numbers. And I think you, you answered it, but I want to acknowledge the question from Kasia Prada. What is the point of hiding the real number of all the more victims, which is from seven to 10 million and turn it into 3.5 when everyone knows the truth and question mark. So again, this, the, 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 these discussions and the debates uh, go on and continue. So I, I think you, you you answered this question. So I, I, I'm turning now back to, to pre people present in this room. So uh, uh, Olga, thank you, please. Yeah. Thank you. The floor thank is you yours. Thank you for, for uh, such uh, rich uh, and uh, great presentation. And uh, and uh, I, uh, I really appreciate that the uh, uh, the, the concept of uh, of uh, uh, ghosts of the past, and uh, uh, it came to my mind with uh, where are uh, also uh, other other concept invisible signs, uh, and uh, as as I was listening to your presentation, I recall all invisible signs in my family story. So it was really, really important. And one of them is uh, maybe later I, I will describe it more precisely, but uh, one of them was present uh, just uh, above our uh, uh, table, Leap National Social Dynamics. And it was kind of invisible sign. Mm -hmm of, of uh, remembrance of uh, Holodomor. But uh, my question was uh, about uh, time uh, frame and uh, especially about uh, the, the first uh, moment when it was possible to, uh, to uh, find graves to, to uh, speak about uh, about uh, Volodomor, and at the same time, it was uh, under German occupation, the new uh, uh, family came. And for example, uh, Arkady Lubchenko uh, diary started with it, and, and he escaped from this uh, uh, hungered uh, Kharkiv to Kiev because of his experience from the thirties. So, and uh, the, the whole diary is, uh, is on, on this uh, precisely experience of the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you. Well, uh, it's, uh, it's great to see you in the US uh, after spending some time together in Poland um, after the full-scale invasion and whose work uh, has been instrumental for me and. Um, even you sharing archival documents with me so many years ago, and it's it's uh, it's great to have you here, and thank you for coming. Yeah, these invisible signs. This is another um, very interesting thing. These sort of um, nonchalant markers of the past that you know are are, are sort of uh, memory markers for what has happened. I think it's a crucial point. Um, and you know this the issue about being able to talk about the famine. Um, for the first time in the 40s. It's a point that Anne Applebaum talks about as well in her book, Under the German Occupation, and there are reasons why they're allowed to talk about this. Um, and I think, you know, some of my work, particularly those, uh, this last chapter on um, the poems that I, I'm writing about, and I, you know, I'm debating throwing in another chapter about others who are talking about these in public spaces, which I found, I think just challenges that a little bit, that notion that it was the first time people could speak. I think that there's a lot of uh, you know, it, it was a time frame when I think that the famine could be talked about again in the 40s, um, but there's evidence and it's here 
that people are talking about it in the 30s. Um, and that's my whole point of, of you know, really highlighting this is that despite the silencing, people found ways. And we need to talk about this. And we need to acknowledge the Ukrainians that work to do this in unique and creative ways, despite the circumstances that they were given at this time. So no doubt it happened in the 40s on a different scale, um, but there's still evidence that it's happening in, in these ways in the 30s. And I think that's absolutely remarkable. So thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. And I was uh, just looking looking at the questions and there was another question about the numbers. And I just want to acknowledge the question, but I think you answered it in terms of whether people at the time were making any estimates of how many people died and you said, Millions, certainly we already already mentioned there. So the second, the, the next question is from Marta Bazuk. Uh, so interesting, John. Could you say more about the sources of the poems? Are these in criminal case files? Are these files separate or part of one investigation or case? Also, you discuss the poetry as a way of processing events after the Holodomor. Do you look at the criminalization of the poetry as part of the uh, after effects of the Holodomor? And I will combine that with, um, there were other questions about poetry. Uh, Sarah Somers uh, writes, I teach high school history and routinely use literature and poetry in my class. Thank you for sharing the fascinating poetry information for us. I tend to use authors like Kopilev and others with my 10th graders. Can you suggest other accessible sources? Kids enjoy the literature quite a bit. It's not dry, et cetera. Yeah, great. Um, thank you for both of these questions and, and hi to Marta, uh, which I will shout out for keeping Holdemore studies um, going fervently. She is the director, you know, uh, she runs the Holdemore Research and Education Consortium. Um, and it's the reason that I got involved in Holdemore studies to begin with, really. I was at their first conference in 2013 when they launched, thanks to Temerte and others. Um, and so just a big shout out to her and, and Frank Sisson and everyone else who has done great work to, to bring in new scholars on the Holdemore. Um, so the poems are separate files. Uh, it's not part of one investigation, and that's what I thought was really interesting. Um, it's not just one person writing. They're from different regions and different parts of Ukraine that were writing uh, poetry that uh, I just happened to locate all together in the archives. So they're very different. They're diff very different files um, from you know different oblasts and things like this. Um, and yeah, I do write about the criminalization of these poems as part of this subsequent um, issue of of rupture. Now, um, you know. I, Hopefully, uh, you know, I'd like to have the translations of these published in the back of the book is ideal at some point, you know, when I get to that stage. Um, and that way others, you know, who work in literature can do more creative things with them and can read them in different ways than I do. I read them as a historical source about evidence that um, it's a unique source, going back to Genia's question of looking for these, you know, pieces of evidence that talk about the famine that you wouldn't otherwise get. So absolutely, I read them for the criminalization as well. Um, the sources for literature, thank you for, did you say she teaches high school? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you for your work. Um, my wife, Emily. Sarah Summers. Yeah. yeah, Sarah Summers. Thank you for your work. Um, my wife, Emily, teaches elementary school and even does small lessons on the famine with her fifth graders when she teaches. Um, and I, I think she is watching her and my daughter, Vera. So I appreciate you watching her so I could give this talk today. Um, yes, there are a number of um, books of Ukrainian poetry about the famine, um, published really, they're in Ukrainian from the 2000s. I have a few of these at home. So if you could send me a private email, um, you can find me online. I'd be happy to send along recommendations about poetry about the famine that you could you could read. And you know we could find ways to translate this for you and get them into classrooms. Um, and maybe others know about poems in English language um, that already exist that we could share as, as well. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let's, let's... Thank you for your talk. Um, just to follow up on the question about the uh, uh, literature and, and children's literature in particular, uh, you probably know uh, the book published uh, just recently by Mateusz Svetlitsky on the uh, Voldemort, on the, I, I guess it's about the reflections uh, on Voldemort in the children's yeah. books, books. Yeah. But my question is about um, the 
uh, multi ethnicity of all of the more, if I might call it like that. The various reflections uh, by other nations, uh, other ethnic groups in Ukraine, uh, reflect uh, affected by by the all of the more. I attended only once uh, a talk by Anna Stern, she's at the University of Toronto, who discussed um, uh, apparently a, a quite an extensive uh, body of uh, records, legal documents uh, by uh, the Jewish communities. But uh, as far as I know, there were also uh, publications and reflections by, for example, Mennonites. Um, so do you ever reflect, consider these aspects of uh, all of the more and its commemoration in your uh, book. And uh, um, another comment um, on the, uh, you used this case study, the, the photography of this uh, family of, of uh, Kostya and his death. Uh, and it, it's, in a way, it's, you know, first art that is dedicated uh, to to Holodomor because uh, you know photography it's a form of art and also of course he was using it as a as a um, way of uh, you know to heal uh, and to 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 process his grief but uh, but it also reminds me well art and even you know the border of uh, martyrology because mm -hmm. he's like he's like a saint you know it's about canonization and and so on. Um, and uh, the last comment on the international responses uh, to all of the more, there was, and you mentioned uh, uh, Canada. And actually, in Canada, there, and in that uh, uh, volume of collected articles uh, dedicated to that correspondence in the Ukrainian context that I'm co editing with my colleagues uh, from Canada, there will be uh, one study which uh, makes a survey of uh, uh, I wasn't aware about it at all, but there, there were lots of like uh, hundreds of publications of letters by people uh, who were sending uh, letters to with, with uh, you know asking for assistance and, and so on, published in the Canadian newspapers, mm -hmm. both in Ukrainian and translated into English. And this is another uh, significant uh, body of uh, you know uh, uh, of. Um, uh, record uh, uh, of what what was going on in Ukraine. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, thanks, Alex, for these questions. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start with the last one and, and work backwards because um, you know there's a whole book, Sergei Sipko's book on um, the whole Demore in Canada's response, publishes a number of these, and I reference some of this in my own work, of course. Um, these direct reports that are coming straight from Ukraine. You can also read them in various newspapers like Dilo um, and, and, and Tishnin and others uh, from the time that are circulating. There's a column in some newspapers that they would do sort of a highlight of what's going on with the famine and they would publish reports directly from Ukraine, people who would cross the border. Um, as for Bokan and art, yeah, I agree with you. Um, there's a whole artistic side, I think, you know, of how to approach this. I, I'm interested in the way he loses a son and processes his grief, but the way he does it is an artistic um, sort of rebuke to the state um, and to society as a whole uh, that I think is worth considering. And then on the multi-ethnic experience, yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a direction that I think uh, Holodomor research needs to go in uh, because there are a number of ethnic groups that, you know, that do suffer because they're on the territories of Ukraine. Um, you know, but there's this great, there's a lot of great work being published now. Um, you know, I'm not always a huge fan of economists, but economists are doing nice work on the, the Holodomor and, and showing that um, Ukrainian populations, of course, like in places like Kuban and, and others and in other places were you know, directly targeted specifically in these regions, but that doesn't stop those who are living in Ukraine from, you know, experiencing the famine as well. And so I do talk about this a little bit, especially in the chapter on international aid, because um, you, you mentioned the Mennonites, so there's a huge, uh, you know, Germans from Russia population that, you know, lives in Ukraine at the time, and they're, um, they, they're getting help from organizations like Bruder and Not in Germany, but also from groups in the Midwest, particularly Kansas and Nebraska, that are sending help to their, you know, their brethren in need. Uh, and there's, you know, a bunch of actually German language newspapers in the, uh, from the American Midwest that you can read about what they're doing to help. Um, there are also reports from certain Baltic countries. Um, so Estonia comes to mind. There's an article, I think it's about Estonia and Latvian governments responding to help their co-ethnics that are suffering in Ukraine and helping them uh, get out of 
the famine inflicted territories and also sending aid packages. And the people that are trying to help Ukrainians are actually learning from some of these other ethnic groups that are getting help in different ways. Um, so there is that experience. And then the last thing I will say too, and there's a book waiting to be written on this that I think is really interesting is um, the experience of the Czech population in Ukraine. You know, they, there was a whole um, Czech group in different parts of Ukraine, but there's, you know, still a town Bohemka that exists uh, and they were rural workers and they farmed and some of them were collectivized. And there's a whole experience of, you know, the Czech, um, the Czech suffering during the whole of the war. Uh, that needs to be sort of examined and analyzed and, and written about. I just, I haven't worked with those documents quite yet. I've come across a few of them here and there, and I've sort of archived them for later. But I think it's another project worth exploring of, you know, the multi-ethnic dimension. And these are also in the SBU archive. You can read about the criminal files of um, some Poles, Germans that are writing to their, you know, their families, um, those letters that are going into Poland as well about the experience, Jewish experience, which also gets sort of mixed up in, um, there is a lot of blame on, uh, that the Jews are responsible for the famine in some in some cases, and this contributes to very problematic narratives. But that's there too, and these things um, get grappled with in the aftermath as well. Uh, thank you. We are technically out of time, actually. You now for ten minutes, we are we are living on, on borrowed from from Megan time. <laughs> so um, uh, what what I suggest, I will uh, basically read uh, there is what what we have online, and you can choose okay. the questions that you can answer to. And for the rest of us, then once we end, if you still have questions and answered, you will have a chance to approach John directly. So let me let me get into my reading mode. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, Jenny, we are living in a large village in Western Ukraine. People told me frequently that Ukrainians are very honest people, true. Uh, but I also observed that everyone mocked everything. I wondered if this was an uh, after effect of the Holodomor, log the barn to protect the stories and livestock. Um, Marine Devin, a great presentation. The words ghosts and hunting and great hunger also bring to mind another colonial famine, the Irish potato famine and its long aftermath in Graven immigration and literature. I see you have just mentioned the uh, epigen uh, epigenetic changes and transgenerational trauma. Can you recommend any works of literature by Holodomor survivors? People online actually, it seems to me, are trying to provide some references. Another question, Vera Rebuzo, can you speak to the repopulation of Eastern Ukraine towards the Holodomor? How did the Soviets use this as an opportunity to resettle the land? Um, uh, Marta Bazyuk. Um, uh, share some some links and important information. And Nina Sakun, I think I have heard some or even many Ukrainians refer to themselves as the little brothers of Russia's big brother. How could they buy this, this myth after the Holodomor? Um, Sarah Somerslav, the, the phrase, they only evoke it to deny it. Um, in, Immediate estimations of the numbers that was questioned from Polina Chesnokova. I mentioned that. And um, then just final thing, it seems to me, from Ksenia Marinyak suggests that I, um, I she, she's not using the language that I'm presenting here, but that I, 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 I omitted some very important points while introducing you. And you wrote an excellent article in the volume 3031 from April 2021 of Ukraine Moderna. So I just correct the mistake and, and mm -hmm. add this information to your, to your bio. And uh, sorry for those who sent their questions and, and um, I didn't read them because clearly I, I look at John, he's, he's, uh, it's, it's overload. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're giving him two minutes to answer all those okay. questions. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I will try and sum up everything that you just said uh, <laughs> as we leave. So um, things being locked up, yeah, I imagine this could be a result of, you know, uh, personal habits developed, 
after being raided uh, by search brigades, the Brahadi, who steal everything um, from Ukrainians during this time. It definitely could be that. It could be for other purposes. People just lock things up in general. I don't know. Uh, the Irish potato famine, yes, I come across this a lot, and I've spent quite a bit of time in Ireland and talking to friends and colleagues there about this. And if you go to, they have a great immigration museum if you've never been. Uh, it's worth checking out. And outside of the museum, not far from there, is the actual famine memorial. Um, and it's these dark statues of emaciated people sort of walking through the city. And it tells a, it invokes a, a you know a, a really dark story, but it's one that resonates with Ukrainians quite well and, and vice versa. Uh, there's a lot of solidarity there. And it, there's a reason that um, you know, the Irish have, have paid attention to the whole of the more and have written about it and continue to write about it. They understand what's at stake there. Uh, the repopulation of Ukraine after the whole of the war, there's been some articles written about this. Um, it is true there they needed workers and um, Russians and some Belarusians also came into eastern Ukraine and populated certain villages uh, and were promised different things uh, in order to do agricultural work there. Um, from what I've been reading from the Ukrainian scholars that you know I think best study this topic, this, of course, did happen, but I don't know that it was enough people to really change the, the population scales in eastern Ukraine um, in, in a way that really changed the demography of Ukraine. So that's what I'll say about that. But you can read the literature um, as well. And then for recommendations, I will just say, please send me an email. I'm always happy to recommend um, things to you or you know, send you to people like the whole Demore Research and Education Consortium that has a number of, you know, resources on their website that can, you know, direct you basically to information on any topics that you want to know about. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for questions, for your questions, for those who joined us online. Before, uh, before we end this meeting, I want to make the announcement regarding our forthcoming event. Uh, the, um, the title is American Politics and the War in Ukraine, a conversation with sterile Jeremiah Starr, hosted by Tenor Tech Contemporary Ukraine Program Director Emily Chanel Justice. And it will be happening uh, on February 21st, which is Wednesday at 5 p.m. in a different in a different uh, building. It's Belfer Case Study Room. So this is the uh, Sieges North across across the street from where we are. Uh, sorry, we are in Sieges North. So this is Sieges South building across across the street from where we are right now. So that's that's the last thing that I, is on my list that I was supposed to. To, to, to read and, and to announce. So thanks. Thanks again, Jim. Yeah, thank you, Siri.